Hi there, I'm Bill Christ, head of school at Hathaway Brown. We thought it would be useful to check in with one of our featured speakers. Um, author Paul Tuff is with me, and you know him from his books and magazine articles, New York Times Magazine, The New Yorker. He's got a new book coming out soon, How Children Succeed, Grit, Curiosity, and the Hidden of Power of Character. Congratulations, it is a terrific book and deserves oh, a, a wide readership, especially among parents and teachers and really everybody interested in the future of America. Uh, and the future of children, um, and, uh, and it's a very important book. What's interesting about it, in many ways, is that it's the, 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 the different sort of lenses you put on the whole complicated question of how to help children thrive and succeed. Um, sometimes that gets into brain chemistry. Uh, sometimes it's more of a macro look at, at the whole history of, uh, of educational reform in the United States. Um, but what I was struck by was the, the passion of the book. I mean, it reads like a personal quest. And I was wondering if uh, you could share with us a little bit about how the, how, how the book was catalyzed. What prompted you to, to tell this story? Um, sure. Well, so I think, I think two things happened at more or less the same time. Uh, one is that, that my first book came out, um, Whatever It Takes. Uh, and so I spent five years reporting in Harlem um, for that book, and it was, it was a big undertaking. Uh, but I still felt at the end of writing that book that, that I had questions that I hadn't quite answered about what was going on in the lives of children and schools, um, not only in low-income neighborhoods like Harlem, but also all over the country. Uh, and more or less at the same time, my wife and I got pregnant with our first child, uh, uh, Ellington, who was born in 2009. Um, and so suddenly these questions uh, had, a, had a much more personal impact. I mean, I, found, I found myself asking, like every um, parent does, especially every new parent, uh, what, first of all, what is success for my child? What do, what do I actually want for him? And then second, how, how, do, how do I help him get there? Like, what, what, what should I be doing? Uh, and what's going on in his brain and in his, uh, for him in all sorts of ways um, that's going to lead him one way or the other? So I, I think it was the combination of, of of that personal connection, but also, you know, still feeling intensely about these political questions, about the the, the state of uh, education in the country as a whole, and especially in low-income communities, um, what we can do to improve outcomes for lots of kids. Back uh, in last fall, you published an article in the New York Times Magazine called "What If the Secret to Success Is Failure," and that really struck a chord. Uh, across the across the country, particularly uh, among among educators, mm -hmm. and it seems like a rather paradoxical formula for for success. Uh, could you talk a little bit about wh why you think failure is is, a, is an important experience in in, um, in shaping a successful child and a, and a good person? Sure. Well, so th that was an idea that I first heard of from Dominic Randolph, the head of school at Riverdale Country School. Um, and he was one of the two school leaders who I wrote about in this um, article who were trying this new project of, of how to help kids in, in their schools, one a low-income charter school, the other a relatively affluent um, independent school, how, how, to, how to help them build their character. Um, and and so Dominic like, t talked a lot about failure, and, and he said something that, that, that was really quite new to me, which is that in high-pressure um, academic environments like uh, Riverdale Country School and lots of other independent schools, and you know, like Ivy League colleges and like the whole kind of meritocratic system that a lot of kids um, grow up in and keep going through, there's a ton of pressure, uh, and it's, there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of stress. Um, but there is not a lot of failure, that, that there, there really is a system where um, kids aren't uh, inclined to and aren't encouraged to try things that they're not going to be able to do um, and fail at them and learn from those failures. And what Dominic said, in some ways is just common sense, though I think there's lots of research behind it as well, um, that that process of learning to of failing uh, and learning from failure is a big part of how you develop character. Um, and, and so that, you know, as I continue to research not only in schools but in, um, uh, in neuroscience and lots of other places, that, that really, that idea really has continued to make sense to me, that there's something about teaching kids how to how to fail, not, not just sort of forcing them into failure. There are lots of kids who have lots of failure in their lives. Um, but, but giving them an opportunity to fail and to learn from that failure, I think, um, is, is crucial in learning uh, character strength. 
let's switch uh, the focus a little bit to broader educational reform in the United States, which is also a topic of your of your book and is a big theme of our conference. Um, you know, it's always been a contested issue, the best ways to reform American schools. And uh, where would you say we are right now in, in the dialogue about educational reform? And where would you like to see it go, uh, you know, in the best possible world? Um, I mean, I think in, in lots of ways, over the last decade, we've made a lot of progress in terms of how we talk about education. I think, I think there's a lot more that's sort of on the table now about the achievement gap, uh, about what, what works in schools and what doesn't than, than was before. Um, I, I, at the same time, I feel like in, in, in a political sense, we are really stuck. Um, that, that every time I kind of wade into a, a, an ed, ed reform debate, I always uh, end up feeling just frustrated because I feel like there are two sides that tend to have their own talking points and their own heroes and their own villains. Uh, and so much of what you hear from either of those sides is just, okay, here are my five talking points, you know. And, and to get a little specific, the one place where I feel um, like, like I want to push the conversation is, is about uh, what's going on in low-income schools. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I've written about a lot and that I think is really important is this set of schools, uh, and the KIPP schools are certainly um, among them, that are having a lot more success than anyone was having 10 or 15 years ago educating low-income kids. Uh, I don't think we've, you know, totally, those schools have totally solved that, um, but I think they've, they've made some real strides. But I also think that there's increasing evidence that those schools don't work for all low-income kids. So they tend to work for the least disadvantaged uh, low-income kids. Um, and one of the things that I hadn't known until I started working on this book, or I hadn't really understood, was that you know, the way the federal government defines uh, disadvantage is by eligibility for free and reduced price lunch. And that's 40% of American school-aged kids. So, you know, it, it's rough if your family is in that category, but there are certainly some families in that category who are a lot better off than, than others. Um, and I think because we just sort of say, well, if that intervention is working for, for kids who are eligible for a lunch subsidy, it must work for all low-income kids. Um, that's not always true. And the fact that I don't think we admit that, and I think especially education reformers don't want to admit that, um, is, I think, making it really difficult for the kids at the bottom. Because we're just saying, okay, we've got the system, we know how it works, we know these charter schools are the answer. And, and that's not enough, I think, for the kids who, you know, I did a lot of reporting on the south side of Chicago in these big, uh, low-performing high schools. And those kids need more help, uh, a different kind of help, than kids at the KIPP schools. Uh, because they're not getting the same kind of support at home. They haven't had the kind of educational opportunities um, along the way. As you said earlier, it does seem as if the whole topic of educational reform in the United States is, uh, is, is frustrating, it can be frustrating, and seems to be chasing its own tail you know, in, in many different instances. But how about the bright side? I mean, are there, are there things going on in the, in the, in the U.S. now that, that you think are, are promising and that, and that uh, really uh, offer um, hope that, you know, that we could really institute significant gains in educational quality across the board in the future? I think so, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, a lot of my book is is looking for and, and looking at interventions that I think are trying new things and are, um, in many cases, really succeeding. Um, I think there's a there's a, uh, there, there's one chapter about this uh, organization in Chicago that is called One Goal that is helping um, disadvantaged kids get to college and persist in college, um, and. They may not have the, the perfect model. I think their model is pretty good, but I think the whole conversation that they are helping to start and, and that is going on around college persistence um, is really important. And I think what they're showing is that a relatively um, late and relatively uh, inexpensive intervention that focuses on non-cognitive skills can make a huge difference in persistence among low-income kids. And partly it can make a huge, uh, it can make a big difference because the numbers right now of, of college persistence, college graduation among low-income kids is just terrible. <laughs> so um, if you can get it from terrible to pretty bad, you, you've made a huge uh, um, step forward. So I think that's a big plus. And, and I think, you know, there's, there's just no question that, that lots of these charter schools and other other um, interventions have, have done amazing things over the last 10 years. Um, the problem is they're just not, uh, they're not yet broad enough, they're not, they're not yet um, replicable enough, 
I think that has something to do with with uh, you know our, our unwillingness to talk about you know which kids those uh, interventions are working best for. So in some ways, the thing that, that I find most reassuring is or most most um, hopeful is the fact that that I think there are people within the education reform world who have made great strides or are great educators and are also starting to say you know these the, this kind of uh, left and right black and white discussion that we've had so far is not going far enough. Um, and you know the fact that that Kip is is uh, doing these character experiments, um, I think, is a great sign. Thank you so much for for your time. It's been fascinating to talk with you, and uh, I'm I'm so glad you're going to be a part of part of uh, this October's summit. Um, and and I and I know how children succeed is 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 about to be um, available, or when, when actually can is it available, and how can folks get a copy? Uh, well, thank you for asking. It's out on September 4th, but it's available now for pre-order uh, on Amazon. Uh, and if you go to my website, which is paultuff.com, um, you can find out more about the book as well as uh, links to order it. Great. That's wonderful. Well, thanks again for visiting with us this morning. We look forward to seeing you at Hathaway Brown on October the 5th when you will keynote the Friday session of our, of our summit. And we really appreciate uh, your involvement in in our conference and, uh, and, and really what you're doing for teachers and parents and educators across the country with your research and your reporting. You're, you're making a tremendous contribution. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled about being a part of the summit this year. Uh, I'm really glad that you are continuing to put it on. I think it's a great resource for uh, lots of people. And, and I'm excited about being a part of it, so I'm looking forward to it as well. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Bye-bye.